Hi everyone, welcome to a QCon Plus presentation about the lessons we learned while building the Confluent Cloud Control Plane. I'm Gwen Shapira, I'm a principal engineer and an engineering manager of the Cloud Native Kafka team here at Confluent. And who is me? I'm Vivek, I'm a senior engineer at Confluent. I come here from Uber where I help build Control Plane and bring a bunch of experience with me. Together, we are building Control Plane for Confluent. So we're here to tell you about the control plan we already built, the problems we ran into with it, the control plan we were trying to fix, to build to fix all those problems, and the new problems that we created on the way. Hopefully there will be some lessons that you will find useful while designing your own architectures. So first of all, Confluent Cloud. The main idea in Confluent Cloud is that we want to make it really easy for everyone to install and manage their own Kafka clusters and other Confluent products like Connect and KSQL. The main idea is that we have three flavors of uh, clusters. We call them SKUs. You can use basic, standard, or dedicated. Basic and standard are multi-tenant. Dedicated means you have your very own brokers in the cloud. And we allow you to size the cluster, but note that we don't size it by number of brokers because who knows what can a broker do? We size it by CKU, which is a capacity unit. So you get a certain amount of throughput, certain amount number of partitions, connections, storage, so forth and so on. And it doesn't end when you provision the cluster. After you have a cluster, you can also change its size. And all this is of use one-click deployment, one-click resize of Kafka, which those of you who manage know it's not always easy. It, this is driven by our control plane. So the reason our control plan is even interesting to talk about is that it's really a challenging problem. And it's a challenging problem because of scale, but not in the way you think about scale normally. So it's not just that we manage thousands of clusters, which we do, but it's also that we have 20 engineering teams working either on the control plane or on products that the control plane manages. We have four different customer facing services. They all require slightly different variants of control. We have four different network options. Obviously, all of those overlap, so now we're at kind of 16 different things customers could do. We have three SKUs, and product constantly changes what exactly basic includes, what starting includes, so we have to have flexibility there. We have to support three different cloud vendors with our lovely, ever-changing APIs. And we need to have some security, because it's your guys' data. Uh, so it's not like every component, every service can just call everywhere in the world. Now, I said the world because we also have a widely wide-range distributed problem where our services are pretty much all over the world. So the way we solve the problem today is that we have the Confluent Cloud Control Plane. And essentially, <laughs> it's a monolith. So not quite, so we have the mothership, this is the control plane, and then we have the network regions. Those are all the places where customers actually have clusters and data. Those are separated, mostly for security, but also because there's really no other way to build it. The nice things that we got right is that the data plane is completely separate. No matter what we do in the control plane, customers only talk to their Kafka clusters and they get the service and their data continue flowing no matter what. The only thing that could happen is that they will not be able to resize or provision. Now, the things that we didn't get right is that we have a monolithic scheduler, and this is responsible for provisioning and resizing and upgrading of all our services. Everything that we do always goes through there, which means that any change to the product, any change to the logic, anything that any team wants to do, it goes through there. And every time we try to release it, we actually release a lot of features in different states from different teams. So we really have to coordinate those releases to make sure that everyone does not have like half a feature in there while we're releasing and nothing, we're not releasing anything that is broken. This is quite painful. In general, working with it, because it has so many circular dependencies, so many un weakly understood dependencies, I would say, it's not an easy component to work with. So this is what we're trying to solve with our new architecture. So every new architecture, starts with requirements. We wanted to keep the good stuff, so the data plane stays independent and the users don't notice anything that we do in the control plane. 
But the main thing is that we need to decouple resources. We really need to give each team its own thing to allow it to be independently and to move faster. But while we do this decoupling, we need, still need to have a trusted source of tools. What does our system have? At the very least, we need to be able to build the customers on a, a current state in the last hour of all their systems. So this view has to be somewhere. In addition, in order to make the whole thing work, we really need clean dependencies and clean interfaces for all those services to talk to each other to allow us to manage them. And we really wanted from operational perspective to make it all self-healing. So if a service goes down, it will get auto restarted and sync will just continue on seamlessly. So we couldn't really, we had to manage state for all those services. So we took all those requirements <laughs> and we got a great developer to de implement them. Awesome. Thank you, Gwen, for the uh, intro and setting up the platform to explaining the architecture. Let's start with taking a sneak peek at our new architecture. So as Gwen mentioned, we have four user-facing products, Kafka, K Connect, KSQL, and Traffic. All the user requests are fronted by a gateway. Depending on what resource the request is for, it gives it to the specific product. We'll speak about Kafka in this particular presentation, but it applies exactly the same for Connect, KSQL, or any other CP that we might have in the future. Kafka fronting service, it, it takes care of user requests and gives a handle back or ID back to user, and it's everything that user sees. Uh, it could be CKUs, it could be the name, it could be anything that user sees. Now this translates into something that we call physical Kafka cluster conflict, which says how many brokers does this CK you need. It's all the physical requirements that, that this logical Kafka requires to, uh, to actually get provisioned or realized. Now this physical Kafka cluster is hosted on a capacity uh, or a K8s, which is controlled by capacity controller. Capacity controller basically takes care of spinning and de-spinning of k That's the underlying infrastructure that we use to host our physical connect, uh, Kafka cluster. The request from capacity controller then lands onto sync service, which goes to satellites where it's actually realized. Uh, now that we saw the new architecture, let's see what's guiding the, what are the basic guiding principles or the North Star for this principle, uh, for the architecture. The three guiding principles for us were, well, there were many, but the basic three were Kizar Sales System, Layer Cake, and Choreography Pattern. Uh, I'll dive deep into the desired state and Layer Cake and hand it over back to Gwen to speak about the choreography. Desired State System. So let's see what this means. Uh, any uh, a system or a service that's responsible for a resource always writes the desired state first which then would trigger downstream events for other services to take care. Uh, the, the principle, all it says is we always write the desired state before we take any action that require other service communication. Let's take an example where a customer already has a Kafka and wants to expand it to four CKUs. The request lands on Gateway. Gateway hands looks at it. It's a Kafka request, gives it to the Kafka fronting service. Kafka fronting service now realizes, oh, I need to expand the Kafka to be four CKUs, writes it, or like does a bunch of validation or quotas and writes it to the database. When it writes to database, we have a Debezium connector, which pulls the database for changes and writes an event to Kafka. This event would trigger a action for PKC controller, where PKC controller now sees it has a request to expand the, LK, uh, the Kafka and it means it needs to expand to 12 brokers. It writes the new desired state, which is 12 brokers to database, which again creates the event on Kafka, and this triggers a downstream capacity controller. Fortunately, in this case, we have an auto scaler, so we don't really need to spin any more Kafka or nodes or node pool, and we write it to database config, the KH config to the database, and send it back to the Kafka. Now, sync service, which is the communication between control plane and all the satellites, reads this, sends it to the satellites where it actually gets realized. When, when the operations are done, the, the actual statuses are percolated all the way back up in exact same manner, but on a different topic. This separation helps us pass the message all the way down and up by guiding, uh, by adhering to the, uh, to the principle of desired state. Another scenario where uh, we had failures on the downstream and how did we, our desired state help us get around it? 
say we want to spin up a new Kafka, goes to PKC controller, capacity controller. Now capacity controller realizes we need to spin up a new K8, but unfortunately we get an error from the cloud provider because of HTTP 429. Uh, it retries, doesn't succeed, hands it back to capacity controller saying that the state could not be fulfilled. Now note that all the way down, would, it would still keep retrying because the desired state isn't met yet. All the errors are from capacity controller to down. And uh, this would keep retrying until the desired state is reached. Uh, let's see a bit more on how desired state helps us with more operations like expansion and shrinks. Say a customer wants to expand from two CKU to four CKUs, puts in the request, this expansion could take up to 20 minutes. It's not very unlikely to request a, a, like a different operation like shrink or maybe even expand it further. What it means is it would boil down to a different number of brokers that each CKU goes on to. Uh, looking to it, like if it was a command-based system, it would go from two to four, back to two, and then again to six. But since it's a desired state and all we do is maintain the new state, get the config and pass it down, the end state, which is data, uh, which is the satellites, would need to go to six CKUs without having to do any of the shrinks. Now, like what are the benefits that we get out of the desired state? Uh, our systems are very, very recoverable. We have had incidents in the past where Customers accidentally deleted the Kafka and asked us to panic recover those Kafka. Since it's a desired state, uh, it's all it is is a desired state in our database, we could easily recover those Kafkas. We have single source of truth. Each service owns a database and is the source of truth for that particular resource. Just because of nature of CDC events, which is communication between different components, it's easily auditable. And since each component reacts to different events on the system, each component can be easily testable. Let's dive into the second principle, which is layer cake. Uh, let's see why do we need this. Uh, say we want to patch our control plane or even release new services. We need to know order in which we release the services so that we can, uh, can upgrade our control plane without having to take any downtime. Second is we have one control plane, uh, which is HA. And in the future, if you want to spin up multiple control planes, we need to know the deterministic way of spinning up services so we can actually do this. In our current architecture, the base is sync service, which kind of comes up first. On the networking side, it's going to be a network controller which speaks to different vendors. So these are the ones that come up first. After this, it's going to be capacity controller which speaks to the sync service or traffic service which speaks to the network controller. These are the second one to come up. Capacity controller is used by all the CPs that we offer. So connect and KSQL now can come up. And uh, this is used by PKC controller, which in turn is used by Kafka. So those can come in, in that order. The last to come up is gateway. Note that the gateway comes up last because if the underlying dependency is not up, it will give errors for those dependencies. So gateway is the last to come up. And now we have a, a clean way to spin up our control plane. Uh, let's see to how, now that we know what layering is, let's see how the communication between services work. Say you come in with a request to increase to four CKUs on a gateway. Gateway looks, it's a Kafka request, goes to Kafka fronting service. Kafka fronting service does quota checks, validations, writes it to a database. This write would trigger a, a, a poll on the Debezium connector, which reads the database change and then writes it to a Kafka topic. This Kafka, creates a, a, ref, a, a refiner on this Kafka would create an event for PKC controller, which now realizes that it needs some action to reach to adhere to this request. Uh, note that this is the same pattern that we try to follow everywhere, but there are some places like Kafka frontend where it speaks to quota service or validation, which are still gRPCs. This is the world where we want to land up in. Now that we have spoken about these two principles, I'll hand it back to Gwen to speak about choreography of microservices and take us home with the message. Thanks, Vivek. So Vivek kind of explained how two services talk to each other via writing state to the database, pulling an event into Kafka, and then other services reacting to these events. 
I just want to show how these things, each services interacting with each other in this manner, actually allows us to build a very resilient uh, system out of all those microservices. So what we learned is that we have those services. Each one owns a resource. It owns the state of this resource. And it owns the changes to the state. The changes to the states are propagated to an event. And theoretically, any other service could get those events. Each service that gets these events owns how it reacts to these events. So the entire logic of what to do when something changes in the system it lies within each service. So as a bunch of examples, Kafka front-end service, we learned from Vivek, it owns the customer Kafka configuration, stores it. There, every time it changes, there is event with a logical config change. The uh, physical Kafka controller knows that every time there is a physical a logical config change, it should examine it. And if it requires any physical changes, for example, a name change does not require a physical change, but a change to the size of the cluster obviously does. So if there is a change to the physical configuration, you put it in your database, it creates another event. The capacity controller knows that if the capacity of Kafka changed, we may need to also change the capacity in Kubernetes. Again, stores the new capacity. So we have all those services, they get events, they understand internally what to do with them, and they store the reaction somewhere else, which creates another chain of events. This idea of a system where each service basically listens to changes in the world, decides how to react to them, and reacts independently is known as the choreography pattern. It's different from what is known as orchestration pattern, where there is a single service that knows what has to be done. It owns the entire logic of the system end to end, and it issues commands. So in an orchestration system, it would be customer wants something. OK, Kafka front end, do this. A Kafka physical, do that. Capacity, do this. And all the logic would be in one place, which is a benefit. But it also means that, again, if any t the team does not own the component with its own logic, you kind of have to work in this centralized system where team, either there's one team that tries to manage all the logic for every other team, which is not great, or teams have to somehow coordinate working on one service, also quite painful. So we really like the way that gives teams independence at the cost of not necessarily having all our logic in one place. Now, the reason this is super important to us is because we have a lot of engineering teams. As all of you know, engineers are kind of expensive. Their time is valuable. We really want to enable them to be as effective as they can be. And having each team owns its logic from the customer interaction to storage to everything else is super, super critical for us. And we make the trade-offs to make everyone a lot more productive this way. OK, so we're moving to a new system. Clearly, it solves all the world problems without any drawbacks at all, except it really does not. So some of the challenges we have encountered are, first of all, observability is really hard. Uh, we said that we really want it to be observable. We want to have a single source of truth. In reality, we still have 20 <laughs> microservices, each one of them with their own state. We collect it all to Kafka. We build systems that allow us to aggregate the state to report on it, but it required us to build a lot of the systems. There is some you can buy off the shelf, but we have an entire observability team responsible just to make sure that we can report on the system. We have another team just for building on the system, again, collecting all this information. Migration turned out to be incredibly difficult. Obviously, we cannot just sh the one day shut down one control plane and bring back a new one. We have to migrate basically service by service and area by area. Each team also owns its migration, uh, which makes things more fun. And this is uh, not trivial in the sense that, OK, we, you can create a new database. You can even use change capture to kind of migrate data between databases. But then at the day, at some point, the service has to stop talking to database A and start on database B. We cannot really have two parallel services because of our ownership principle. So there will be a point where we cut off services with a small downtime, luckily only on the control plane. The data plane will always stay up. Testing, each, it's, we made it really easy for each team to test its own component. 
yay, this is great. <laughs> but it's, uh, there are concerns that are very cross-cutting. So security, really, it's not just each component being secure, but things like who is authorized to do what, as the user authenticated, you really need to take care of it across the, all of the systems in a very unified manner. We ended up with teams that are responsible for those cross-cutting concerns rather than component. We suspect that their life is not quite as good as the life we built for the component owners. As they have to talk to a lot of other teams, they have to do a lot of coordination. I wish we had a good solution for them so far. This is where you are. Please let us know if you manage to solve this one. And the last one is that we discovered that our internal needs and operations are not the same as what customer needs because customers work on one cluster at a time. We really need to do things on hundreds of clusters thousands of clusters at a time. So we were kind of behind on building our own tools and we need to catch up. But again, a large body of work that we semi forgot about doing. With all those challenges, all those principles, let's close this with some of our key lessons. What worked really well for us is persisting state with Kafka events. It's really the foundation of making something that's recoverable we have the entire auditable history of every change because we record the state in an event and not just we added something or we removed something. It makes things recoverable, it makes things auditable, uh, observable. We depend on this system a lot. Layer cake is fantastic, both in kind of avoiding those cyclic dependencies, which make it hard to start a service, and also in debugging and diagnosing. The fact that we know exactly who is calling whom, that calls only go in a certain direction, we have a very clear dependency graph, made our life much more manageable than it otherwise would be. And even with those improvements, breaking a monolith is always challenging. If you do it, we recommend do not leave, how do we test end-to-end -end concerns uh, and how do we build operational tools to, and to the end, <laughs> like we did, <laughs> start thinking about it very, very early on. With those things in mind, Thank you very much for spending this time with us. Thank you very much. We are available on Twitter or you can email us and we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, so I think I'm now taking questions from the chat. Uh, so I see a question from Rishi. How would you compare the ease of a new team getting up to speed with Confluent Kafka when compared to Axon or Eventuate? I have to say, I never used Axon and Eventuate, so I really can't answer that one. <laughs> Charles, how, like, you will just answer questions from the chat? Um, I, I can, I can um, help you out a bit and sort of throw some questions at you if you like. So could we talk a bit about the layer cake model um, of dependencies and boundaries? I'm presuming that since each service has its own logic for reacting to events, you need to ensure that each layer only modifies its own resources. So I got that right. Absolutely. This is like we call it the single writer principle, and it's kind of the reason anything works at all. And I have to know, because you tweeted me yesterday about it, that um, <laughs> that doesn't always quite work out as planned. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, okay. So I will actually have a story to share. I don't know if Vivek was part of this incident or not. Um, basically, we, when we started rolling out this model and we kind of making modifications to the way we write our connectors, and uh, while deploying, we deleted the Division connector in um, the development environment. And basically, the service that owns it, the Connect service, like one of the things it did as part of being deleted is discover, hey, I'm the last thing that has been using this Kafka cluster, let's delete the Kafka cluster. And it sent an API request to delete the Kafka cluster. Luckily, it didn't work. But that kind of demonstrates how important it is to really define which service owns what responsibility. Like if you are an upstream service, you don't really get to delete stuff that belongs to downstream services. You can only delete your stuff and publish an event that says, hey, I, I deleted my stuff, maybe you guys want to do something. But then the downstream services will have their own logic and they will decide if they want to actually delete something as a result or maybe not do anything at all and ignore the event. 
Um, yeah, I'm glad we caught it in development, so it would have been quite disastrous in production. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. question. Go on. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, sorry, somebody in the chat asked about the uh, the frameworks and how does it compare to Confluent Cloud and why don't we take that as a dependency on our control plane? I think I can give a little more light into that. So if you really look at it, uh, what we get out of those frameworks is what we have in Kafka already. And in Kafka, we have a dependency for the communication between our control plane to satellites. Having these additional frameworks is going to be one more dependency for us to worry about. And like by using DevSM and uh, like existing relational databases, we can get those those features right into our control plane without taking any additional dependencies. That's the biggest takeaway, like why we did not go with an existing framework. And uh, the other question was like, how does it compare with like Kafka? Like Kafka is like an event streaming, and that is just very very specific frameworks. Like happy to use it in your control plane. Might need more work, but go for it. There's a question in the chat from uh, Nicholas here that says, in terms of resiliency, how do you react or manage the outage of the central control plane? Basically, it's one of our least impactful incidents because yep. all everything that exists keeps on working, right? So if you have a Kafka and you depend on it for your architecture, like if this is not like your own Kafka is not going away. That's kind of right. on the letter plan. Uh, so we have a control plan outage. We may post in the you know, status page, hey, yeah. you now cannot create new clusters or you now cannot expand your cluster. And it's kind of sad, but if you cannot create new yeah. clusters for an hour, usually nobody really... is mad at us. I mean, there'll be, yeah, tickets, but yeah. <laughs> I think, yes, we would want to go into multi-cloud and that's one of the principles we also wanted to follow because we see ourselves in multi-clouds and for us, we want like a, a script that we can just run and get our control plane up. That's what that's one of the reasons why we have these principles going in the future. Interesting. And so when you have a control plane in AWS and GCP, we can use Kafka to replicate the events back and forth. Yep. That would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Another question in the chat here, which is, are there specific patterns that the microservices follow in order to persist data to its own database and then safely publish, uh, sorry, it's scrolling as I'm trying to read it, and safely publish its associated yeah. events <laughs> as this publishing can fail after persisting to the database. So it's basically it's a distributed yeah. transaction problem, I guess. It's not a distributed transaction problem. That's the exact thing. It That's because we use the outbox pattern. So basically we persist to a database and it has a data, relational database guarantees, right? So yeah. I do a commit and that's it. The event is guaranteed to be persisted in the database no matter what. And then we have the busy. It guarantees is that no matter what happens, the event will eventually make it from the database to Kafka. And yeah. Kafka has its own guarantees that after an event was published to Kafka, no matter what happens, the consumers will eventually see it. So yes, like if some stuff goes wrong, it may be delayed for a while and I know that if you create a cluster in our cloud, it tells you, yeah, the cluster will be up in like 24 hours and everyone's like 24 hours, it's insane. We gave a very large <laughs> time span. So essentially, that's kind of like, we have a chain of events and we know that each component has really strong guarantees, uh, which is not like distributed transactions where you actually need two separate things yep. to kind of do two phase commits in order to yep. have any kind of guarantees. You mentioned during the talk, you mentioned the satellite um, abstraction briefly. Can you talk a bit more about it? What are the satellites made up of? What's kind of in there? Uh, sure, I can take that. Uh, it's kind of easy because satellites are basically our, our, our uh, data planes. So imagine, I don't know, AWS, US West 2. Any, uh, anything we spin up there is going to be a satellite. So any K8 that gets spun up there is, is a satellite. We call it satellite because it kind of directly does operations with customers and the the orchestration of satellite is done through control plane. So any IO, creation, deletion, expansion, any of those happen through control plane, but once it gets there, it directly communicates to the customer's uh, IO. So that's what the satellite basically is. And then is that scoped to a single Kubernetes cluster? Uh, so, is there a question like, is satellite a single Kubernetes cluster? 
Yes. No. Like we can have multiple of those. Like. It, can you yeah. talk a bit more about the data plane? Um, what does the Kafka data plane say consist of? What does the, where does the Kafka data plane installed or sorry I'm missing something. Um, so what's the what's the scope of it and what does the, what's the data plane made up of? So yeah, the data plane is made up of several thousand Kafka clusters, it's like close to a thousand K SQL clusters, several thousand connectors. Uh, basically, this is what our customers are paying for us for. So. This is like, it's our own Kafka and that we are running and it's yep. a managed service. So you go to our site, you spin up a Kafka, you give us money, we give you a Kafka cluster in return and we run it for you. So the entire control plan is to allow us to run all those Kafka clusters for our customers. And because yep. our customers are on AWS, GCP, Azure, they, we kind of have to spin up Kafka clusters there. They have different security requirements. Some of them want to be on the public internet. Some of them want to be on a VPC. Some of them like private link. So that's why we can have to kind of get creative with which kind of Kubernetes cluster each customer gets. If you are okay with public internet, you will be in a public Kubernetes cluster that has a lot of other clusters on it. Uh, that's why a satellite can have more than one Kafka cluster. On the other hand, if you want VPC peering, you will have your own VPC with your own Kubernetes, your own Kafka. Uh, if you have KSQL, your own KSQL kind of VPC peered uh, through uh, to your cluster. And the whole thing is that our control plane is just a thin layer to manage all of this. Our control plane is not really the thing we're selling to customers. It's kind of like the best case scenario, it's so easy to use, you'll ignore it completely. <laughs> Also, if you go back to the layer cake, that's exactly how your data plane is going to look like. You'll have a site, you'll have a Kubernetes, PKC, LKCs, and th that's what Gwen's referring to. The thousand of Kafka's are basically those customer facing Kafka's. And that's like literally the, the, the side section of data plane in the control plane. We just manage all of that through control plane, but that's how it looks as in reality. Got you. Thank you. Um, how do you orchestrate multiple uh, Kubernetes resource deployment? Are you using uh, federated mechanisms for that? Oh, uh, I think we have our own operator. Actually, I yeah, I, yeah, right. Like we have our own operator. That works. That's what we use to. Uh, we do have our own operator, and then yeah. we also run on managed Kubernetes, so EKS, yeah. AKS, and all that. Yeah. And then we, in order, because every managed Kubernetes is different, we kind of created our own Kubernetes controller on top of that. So internally, if I have some logic that requires a new Kubernetes cluster, I publish an event that yeah. says I am going to use some more resources. The Kubernetes controller gets the event and it says, oh, when we need more resources. Uh, and it knows, oh, the, we're going to want resources on Azure. Let me talk to the AKS and create those resources, handle all the retries, all the rate limiting, everything that's required. And eventually, Gwen will get the resources that she asked for. So we kind of abstract all of it. That's exactly how we created this layer cake. We abstract right. those low level Kubernetes yes. resources from like, yep. engineers who only worry about Kafka, I guess. Yep. <laughs> Um, there's another question in the chat, which is, do you somehow have a global or federated monitoring of all the Kafka clusters? Yeah, our monitoring is, that's a um, <laughs> pain a bit painful. So uh, we use um, a Datadog no. to basically monitor all of it, but we also yeah. have our own metrics pipeline uh, for more advanced analytics on our metrics. So we have basically, we, that's something that we, it would be its own architecture talk. How do we actually observe those thousands of clusters? Because we've written log collections, metrics collection, a lot, like we just did a lot of telemetry work on its own right. And yeah, I will need to invite uh, other people from another team to talk yeah. about the, because like our observability architecture is kind of cool on its yeah. own. So that that's a whole separate talk, maybe for another Q Yeah, exactly. Exactly, because like you can imagine that collecting events from thousands of clusters is its own uh, very challenging problem. 
Sneak peek, we use Kafka. <laughs> <laughs> no, really? <laughs> um, uh, there was a question earlier which I missed, which was, um, do you see the need for a service mesh for service-to-service -service communication? Uh, I think I can take that maybe. Yeah, uh, I think right now, uh, our, our real proxy is at the, at the uh, site where, where we kind of have to do all of this, this kind of routing principles uh, within the data plane, only at the site. With, on our control plane, I think we have only a handful of services. I think service mesh, to me, that's yet another dependency. And right now it's still manageable. It's, it's not even crossed hundreds of services on the control plane yet. Uh, so to the answer that question, maybe in the future, but I don't think we need it right now. Uh, I can even say that what we've implemented is so much closer to data mesh than it is to service mesh because True. of the way that our services communicate more via persistent events than True. via gRPC. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I can't say that we'll never have a service mesh, but I yeah. think we kind of went in a slightly different direction. Okay, we are getting towards the end of our time. Um, I'll try and throw one more question in a second, but um, are you both able to join the okay. Zoom chat for a few minutes afterwards? Gwen, I know you're doing the panel as well. So it's yeah, I'm on a panel. Vivek will join us. I'll be with but you. But if Vivek, you're able to join, that's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. There's a couple more questions in here. Um, do you have a need where you have to rebuild the entire control plane or data plane in the event of a major vulnerability? That's a very good one. Um, be, rebuilding the entire data plane. I mean, it's yeah. We tried. It's time consuming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think the same is true yeah. for the control plane, but yeah. a, lot, a lot easier. Yeah. We do have to build our data plane when a cloud provider starts a new region. But as one said, it's kind of time consuming and. Yeah, we never had a need for that on the control plane, but yeah. We had to upgrade our entire data plane yes. <laughs> in about, uh, I think we managed to do it in three days. Yeah. Um, and, but like, and I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's intense, but uh, <laughs> definitely doable. If we need to rebuild the whole control plane, I think yeah. that's a lot easier, right? Because that's where the, actually the layer cake helps Sorry. us a lot to True. rebuild it. Yeah. Yeah, so, and we do it every once in a while, right? When we decide to have like a new uh, testing environment. And yep, yep. All our upgrades do follow that. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and maybe there's time for one more question. Um, so, if you have a global customer who operates out of US and EU regions, are you able to segregate and keep the EU workloads in the EU and the US workloads in the US? Oh, of course. <laughs> I mean, that would be not only really weird to mix them up, also quite illegal, I so, believe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously every resource, when it, like, yeah. at the highest level, when it gets created, it gets created within a cloud world or within a region. Right on. Like, I mean, there is literally, like, and this is our information that we maintain consistent all over the place. Yep. Like, this yep. would be... And we also build differently. So probably we'll have our own finance people really upset if we mix anything up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the data Excellent. transfer cost, everything would, I don't know, what would happen to that? <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, I mean, yeah. you basically get assigned to a Kubernetes uh, mm -hmm. resource in your region and network in your region and everything will be in your region. Exactly. Now That's we have people asking for zones. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. We are at time. As I say, Vivek will be in the Zoom room immediately after this, and then we have a panel with Wes Rice talking some more about um, event-driven architectures, which Gwen will be joining us on. So thank you both very much indeed again. Fantastic talk. Really enjoyed that.